Please be seated and welcome to everyone. Let me take this opportunity first, starting over in our VIP section, uh, Donald and Barbara Zucker, a familiar name at this medical school. And on the stage, members of the Joint Board of Overseers, the Hofstra Deans, Vice Presidents, Leadership Team of the School of Medicine, Board Members, Trustees, and the VIPs sitting over here. And let me welcome the family members who have already shown their, the power of their voices and applauds, and to our students, the center of attention today. Let me point out that our Grand Marshal, uh, who put the mace right here, is Dr. David Elkowitz. He led the procession. Our faculty marshal, Dr. Penny Stern, faculty council president. And graduate marshals, Dr. Joanne Willey, who won the first 100 weeks Teacher of the Year from this school, and Dr. Roya Samuels, winner of the Teacher of the Year for the second 100 weeks. You'll notice that many of our graduates are wearing medals, pins, and all types of notes of distinction. They reflect the, this particular one is the Academy of Academic Educators, the students are wearing Distinction in Research, Gold Humanism Society, Alpha Omega Alpha, the Medical School Honor Society, Departmental Awards, and Certificates of Special Graduation Proficiency. Please rise as we begin our graduation ceremony with an invocation from Reverend Sonia True Wisdom, the Director of Pastoral Care at Northern Westchester Hospital. Let us pray. Lord, we indeed are grateful to be here today in this wonderful occasion to celebrate hard work and purpose. We thank you for the gifts that you've placed in everyone here today. We thank you for the hands that you have blessed. We thank you for the studies they've gone through and those who have taught them and mentored them. May that bond never be broken. I pray that you'll grant them compassion, that they will serve with humility. Grant them, O oh Lord, we pray, mercy, that they may serve with patience. Grant them discernment, that they will listen and see beyond the obvious, and grant them the courage to be truly human. And now would you bless them? Would you bless the work of their hands? Would you bless all that they do? Would you remember the good they do? And all that pertains to their life, would you grant peace? And we all say, Amen. Thank you. And now remain standing as Elise Stave, one of our graduates today, will lead us in the singing of our national anthem. <laughs> Elise? Thank you, 
release, and everyone can be seated. And let me now introduce the president of Hofstra University, Dr. Stuart Rabinowitz. Thank you, and good afternoon. Um, didn't anybody tell her doctors are not supposed to be able to sing or tell jokes? Those are two things they don't do well, but that was beautiful. Thank you. Dr. Smith, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty administration, guests of the university and the health system. Also, if I can, a special acknowledgement to Barbara and Donald Zucker, who have afforded us the privilege of naming this medical school after them. And most importantly, the graduates and their incredibly proud and happy for family and friends. Welcome to the commencement ceremony for the fifth graduating class of the Barbara and Donald Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. We are here this afternoon. We are here this afternoon to celebrate, to celebrate the incredible accomplishments and the hard work of these remarkable graduates and the sacrifices, the many sacrifices that we know have been made on their behalf by family and friends. The end of this academic year, which is coming shortly, marks my 47th year in higher education and at Hostra. I know I look significantly younger than that, but why are you laughing? Why was it? So it's a good thing that I love commencements, since I go to so many of them. And, and I do love commencements, and I love all our school's commencements. And wherever our other deans are sitting up here today, I love the commencement of every single one of our school. This commencement, the medical school commencement, if I were to be honest, which I try always to be, is a little bit special for me. First, because this incredibly successful medical school began during my tenure as the president of the university. Secondly, because my daughter is a physician, and since I feel like I lived through medical school with her, I know firsthand about how hard each of you have worked, how many long hours you have put in to get to this day. And frankly, I am in awe of your successes. In fact, I have spent the last two months handing out copies of this piece of paper, which is your residency matches in March, to everybody that I meet. In fact, my wife Nancy and I recently went to the airport. I found myself handing out copies <laughs> to the deplaning passengers from Boca. I mean, it's just incredible. We are so tremendously proud of you. The class of 2019 not only has a 100% match, but matched with the best and most prominent hospitals and health systems in the, in the entire nation, which is an astonishing accomplishment for a medical school which is only graduating its fifth class. There's only one thing I am proud to display more often than your list of residencies, and that's my iPhone pictures of my two and a half year old grandson, Jack Benjamin Rabinowitz. By the way, Jack's career path, I am assured by Dean Smith, in medicine has already been well mapped out, as long as he gets incredibly high MCATs and college GPA. That's what that Dean Smith has promised me, appreciate it. More generally, we admire the career path you have chosen. You have chosen a life's work of healing, of relieving human suffering, and of service to others. We know that to be a great physician requires high intelligence, tenacity, dedication, hard work, and empathy for your patients as human beings. And we are so confident that the members of the class of 2019 will be great physicians. Now, contrary to the expectations of some of you, I am not going to use my time at the podium to give you career advice. 
even though I have an encyclopedic knowledge of diseases and their symptoms. I acquire that as a lifelong hypochondriac and not, a, not as a medical professional. Come on, what are you laughing at? As a first year student, you all became hypochondriacs. I know that. So fortunately for you, I will leave career advice to our next speakers who are so much better qualified to give it. Instead, I simply want to close my remarks today as I have for the past 17 years as president of this great university. And I simply want to wish each and every member of the graduating class well. I wish each of you all of the success you think you need and all that your talent and your hard work earns for you. I wish that you will have the perspective to forgive yourself and learn from the mistakes because mistakes are inevitable. And as the father of a successful and dedicated physician, I especially wish that you will find the time in your busy professional life for the love of family and friends. The School of Medicine class of 2019 leaves here with our admiration and our affection. We hope you will maintain your ties to your classmates and of course, your alma mater. From this day forward, your accomplishments will always be the most important driver of the value of the reputation of this School of Medicine. The university and the health system will always welcome you back home. On behalf of the faculty, the administration, and the staff of the School of Medicine, I extend to each of you our heartiest congratulations and our warmest wishes for your success and happiness. Thank you. Copy, copies will be available at the close of the ceremony. It's now my honor and privilege to uh, introduce briefly uh, and ask to come to the podium uh, Michael Dowling, who is the CEO, obviously, of Northwell Health. Uh, he is one of the true visionaries in healthcare in the United States today and around the world. And he actually um, Guy, has guided Northwell through its first partnership between North Shore and Long Island Jewish Hospitals into the fabulous multifaceted health system that Northwell is today. And actually, he is sort of my partner, uh, was my original partner in the creation of this medical school. We had breakfast one morning um, at the Garden City Hotel. I paid. Um, it took us 35 minutes. He said, you want to have a medical school together? I said, yes, and then we talked about sports. Uh, Michael Dowling. Uh, thank you very, very much, Stuart. And by the way, um, he did not pay. Um, I'm delighted to be here and to say congratulations uh, to all of you on behalf of everybody. And as uh, Stuart said, uh, this is a remarkable occasion. And also uh, congratulations to the family members and the supporters and the grandparents and the children of all of you because quite frankly, um, they are the cast, a large cast of supporters that helped you get to where you are today. We all believe that we do things completely by ourselves, but as we all know, if we're honest, that we play a major role by doing what we do ourselves, but we're supported by a large cast of people that help us along the way, and we should never forget it. And today, obviously, is a very special day for you. It's the culmination of a dream, and obviously the culmination of a dream for your parents and your family members. Today, will be, I would assume, etched in your memory. Other occasions that you will in, get involved in and other occasions like this will fade over time, but I doubt that today you will forget. You will remember today. When people ask you what was one of the most important days of your life, you will look back and say, it was this day. Because today, you are entering a life of extraordinary 
opportunity and obviously one of great obligation and responsibility. People from this day forward, many already up to this point, but especially from this day forward, people put their trust in you. They share their fears and their dreams and their perceptions and their expectations with you. So you're a physician, which brings along with it major obligations, as I just mentioned. But you're more than a physician. You are a healer. You're going to be a confident, an influencer, a teacher, a community leader, for many of you hopefully, a national leader. People will listen to you. They will believe you. As a doctor, people will believe that you know almost everything about everything, be it true or not. So what you say about everything is important because people trust what doctors say for the most part. And as we're going through a transformation in healthcare, and healthcare is being transformed, as you all know, even though slowly, should move faster. But you have to be a participant in this as a change agent, as a builder, as an architect, as a unifier. You have to be one who promotes the concept of wellness who understands the social issues that affect people's life and affect people's health. It's just not only about medical care. It's about all of those other social circumstances. As you, I am sure, have experienced as you rode the ambulances and went to people's homes and have been out in the facilities across the health system over the last couple of years. So you have an opportunity, quite frankly, to help create the future. That's the obligation. To go above and beyond your individual specialty, but to change, to get pe other people to change, to and honestly, to make a difference. So you're going to help, you're going to be the reformers of the future. The world is changing, the circumstances are changing, the demands are changing. You have to be part of that action, along with performing your day-to-day -day work as treating patients and all of those other things that come with it. You're privileged as of today and going forward. That brings with it a requirement that you continually push to do more. And as you leave here, for many of you, and you go on to other places to do your residency, I have only one request. Remember where it started. Remember the Zucker School of Medicine. Remember the experiences. And as Stuart Rabinowitz just said, remember, you're always welcome back. So to all of you, to your parents, and your families, and your friends, cherish this day. It's not the end. It's the beginning of a new beginning. Congratulations. It's now my uh, privilege to ask Dean Larry Smith to come forward with his candidate for an honorary degree, Dr. Jordan J. Cohen. So this is another special first for today. Our first honorary degree given to Dr. Jordan Cohn, 
a very long-term personal friend and colleague of mine. Graduate of Harvard Medical School, as you can see from the fancy robe. Uh, <laughs> professor of medicine and actually former dean at Stony Brook Medical School, where I first met Dr. Cohn. Chair of the American Board of Internal Medicine, Vice Chair of the Board of Regents of the American College of Physicians, President of the Association of American Medical Colleges, Chairman Emeritus and Chairman of the Board of the Arnold P. Gold Foundation, Professor Emeritus of George Washington University, and many others. Dr. Cohen is truly attributed with taking the Association of American Medical Colleges and raising it to probably the most influential organization in medicine in this country for health care reform and health policy. And it is my privilege to be the person who introduces Dr. Cohen. So Dr. Rabinowitz, for your decades of leadership to Dr. Cohen, for your decades of leadership in all aspects of academic medicine and all of your contributions to this critical field, I am pleased to bestow upon you no, that's your bird. <laughs> I can't bestow anything. Let me, I, let I, me, let me recommend and can, that you confer his honorary degree. I, I, I'm doing what he said. Yes. So it is uh, my honor to confer this Doctor of Humane Letters degree upon uh, Dr. Cohn. And I would just add to the introduction. Have you been hooded already? Yes. I, I would just add to the introduction that Dr. Cohn was a mentor to Dean Smith and I in, when we first started to think about this medical school. Thank you. Is it official? You Is it official? Yeah. Did he hood you already? He did. <laughs> well, I, 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 I think this is mine. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, President Rinovitz and Dean Smith. Uh, this is really a, an exceptional honor for me. I can tell you, I've, this is now, I'm a, I feel I'm an official part of this medical school, even though I've felt for a long time a very close relationship with this school. Uh, first of all, as you know, as, as, doc, as Dean Smith, we knew each other at Stony Brook. He was my primary care doctor when I was there. So he's come a long way. We, I've kind of stayed the same. <laughs> In any event, um, I also have privileged to say that I was here at the inception of this medical school. In fact, before the inception, I was here in, in, Dr. in, in, in President Rabinowitz's office when the medical school was a gleam in his eye. He was thinking about, wouldn't it be great if Hofstra had a medical school? Sure enough, here we are, less than a decade later, graduating the fifth class of this wonderful medical school. And I have observed over this period of time how Dean Smith and President uh, Dowling have taken the opportunity that Hostra provided for them to create what is truly one of the most innovative, one of the most exciting, one of the most successful new medical schools in the country. So you who are graduating today should be extremely proud and very happy that you chose this school uh, to begin your medical career. Truly exceptional place. So I'm. I'm really privileged to be among the first people to address you as graduates of the school, and the first honorary degree recipient of the school is, is an incredibly moving tribute for me, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful. So the occasion actually warrants my saying something auspicious. I tried to think, what is it I could say to you that would be memorable? But I said, well, let me look in the literature. Let me see what other commencement speeches have done. So I Googled commencement addresses, <laughs> and I found, the first thing I stumbled upon was the longest commencement address on record. It was delivered in the 19th century at Harvard. It was six hours long, <laughs> three hours in Greek, followed by three additional hours with the same text in Latin. So I figured that wasn't a very good inspiration for me today. I didn't think you'd sit that long. So then I stumbled on what was allegedly the shortest commencement address on record. It's allegedly have, it was delivered more recently by Woody Allen. He got up and he said to the graduates, we've given you a perfect world. Don't screw it up. And then he sat down. 
Well, that was pretty short. <laughs> I didn't think that would go over either. And besides which, I didn't think the message was exactly right. We're not giving you a perfect world. We're certainly not giving you a perfect political world or a perfectly just world. We are giving you some powerful tools that you can use to make the world, if not a perfect place, certainly a much healthier place. Well, you know these tools better than I do. They include being able to edit the human genome to cure and prevent diseases and even prevent pandemics that have plagued humanity forever. Artificial intelligence empowered by these incredibly sophisticated algorithms that are gonna make your life a lot easier, eliminate a lot of administrative tasks, and more importantly, make your decisions, therapeutic and, and, and uh, diagnostic decisions, much more accurate, much less error prone. And then there's, there's advanced robotics that are gonna make surgery even safer than it is today, and in addition, provide tremendous relief for a lot of people who are physically disabled and otherwise ha handicapped. So these are enormous, powerful tools that our generation is leaving you and trusting that you're gonna use them wisely. But we're also, unfortunately, leaving you with some very powerful forces that if left unchallenged, could actually do a lot of difficulty, could actually make things bad. They could indeed make the world a better place, a worse place. So what are those forces? Well, they're, 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 that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. These powerful forces that are currently at play, either wittingly or unwittingly, that could oblige you to work in a system that undervalues and devalues humanistic medical care, that could undermine your commitment, your passion for truly caring for the human beings who are seeking your help. And I'm sure you're familiar with what Francis Will Peabody had to say. In fact, he was quoted this morning at your award ceremony by one of your faculty. He's, his words were timeless and they were uttered almost 100 years ago and they still remain a foundational truth about our profession and they're what the core of what I want to talk to you about. What Dr. Peabody said was one of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity. For the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. The secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. Now you might ask, well, what forces could possibly dissuade you from adhering to that maxim of Dr. Peabody's? Well, they are the forces at play in the marketplace, in the healthcare marketplace, that stem, stem from the mistaken belief that medicine is just another business. Now, those who promote that view would have us believe as physicians that our motto ought to be the motto of the marketplace. Caveat emptor, buyer beware rather than the motto of Hippocrates, primum non nosari, first, do no harm. Keep your patient's interest uppermost. Now you're all perfectly aware, I'm sure, that commercialism has made enormous inroads into, the, into American medicine, driven largely, of course, by the desire, the need to control healthcare costs. We are, after all, a capitalist society. We rely upon market forces to accomplish many societal goals. But the over-reliance on market forces, on classic market forces to control healthcare costs has produced some truly profound and wrenching changes in American medicine. Changes that I can guarantee you were totally unimaginable when I was sitting in your seats in 1960. Medicine is becoming more and more transactional, less and less based upon relationships between and among human beings. Pay for performance is becoming the most dominant mode of physician compensation, as if doctors needed financial incentives to do the right thing. Medical practice in this market-dominated world is rewarded more for efficiency and productivity than it is for establishing caring relationships with patients and the time that doctors need to truly get to know their patients as human beings is systematically undervalued. 
Now, let me be clear. In delivering medical care, being businesslike is absolutely essential. We must be cost conscious. We've got to, we've got to avoid wasting scarce resources. We've got to fulfill our commitments to our colleagues and to our patients. We've got to be mindful of our patients and their families' convenience so that we don't squander their time. All of those are good business practices. <clears throat> but behaving as if we are only a business is when we begin to lose contact with our fundamental commitment as professionals, where commercialism begins to invade our relationship with our patients and prevent us from delivering truly quality care and caring about our patients and keeping their interests uppermost. Now, William Osler, famous physician from Johns Hopkins, as I'm sure you all know, wrote over 100 years ago, in 1903, he wrote because he was aware of this issue. He said, the practice of medicine is not a business and can never be one. Our fellow creatures cannot be dealt with as a man deals with corn and coal. The human heart by which we live must control our professional relations. Now, I assume that most of you, if not all of you, elected to study medicine as I did because you were seeking a life of purpose and meaning. You knew that being a doctor, joining this noble profession, whose calling, whose sole purpose is helping others, that helping others is meaningful work, and that doing meaningful work can be enormously satisfying, indeed joyful. Now, for most of us, that joy resides in the meaningful relationships we establish by caring, truly caring for our patients, a la Francis Well Peabody. The secret, and I would add the joy of the care of the patient, is in caring for the patient. But when medicine is practiced as if it were just another business and not a noble calling, that's when doctors begin to lose sight of their fundamental responsibility. That's when the work of doctors seems less meaningful, certainly less joyful. Well, you might ask, what's so bad about taking the joy out of being a doctor? After all, it's a pretty good way to make a living. Well, here are some of the things that happen when doctor's work no longer feels joyful or meaningful. Doctors become disillusioned with the profession. And they even counsel their kids and their friends' kids to seek other lines of work. They find it easier to abandon their commitment to professionalism, become cynical, find it easier to engage in conflicts of interest. They experience burnout and are more likely to suffer from depression. And they are more likely to leave practice prematurely, leaving gaps for others to fill. What's even worse, consider what happens to patients who are cared for by joyless doctors. They feel as if they're treated like objects, not like human beings. They report less satisfaction with their care, and indeed, they are likely to receive poor quality care. Medical errors are much more common under such circumstances. And maybe worse of all, patients who are cared for by joyless doctors lose trust in their doctors lose trust in the medical profession in general. Now remember, trust is the glue that binds us as professionals to our social contract. Trust is earned, not owed, just because we have an MD behind our name. We must earn that trust every day that we are engaged in this noble profession. Well, tinkering around the edges of our current dysfunctional healthcare system with its myopic belief that good medicine can be delivered on a conveyor belt will not suffice to ensure that your work continues to be meaningful and joyful. What's required at minimum is recognition by payers and policymakers that humanistic medical care is not just good medicine, it's good business, it's good for the bottom line. Your task is to raise your voice Exert your First Amendment rights. Engage with your colleagues. Make the business case for
for valuing the time required to establish and maintain meaningful relationships with your patients. Now, happily, there is abundant evidence to support your arguments. Numerous studies have shown convincingly that individuals and organizations that practice humanistic care get better scores on patient satisfaction questionnaires, evidence greater patient loyalty, have measurably better outcomes and better quality metrics, suffer fewer medical errors and fewer malpractice suits, and have less turnover of their providers because of less burnout. All very good things for the bottom line. So, I urge you, speak these truths to power. As physicians, you are arguably, and you are arguably alone as physicians, having the knowledge, the wisdom, the moral authority to push back, to insist that payers recognize the value of meaningful doctor-patient relationships and value the time it takes to establish them. And I would say as graduates of this medical school, so deeply embedded in the value of humanistic medical care, all of you have learned over and over again how important it is to be compassionate, to be empathetic, to understand your patients as, as human beings. You especially, I think, are charged with the responsibility to take on this task. And if you're successful, and I pray you will be, you can prevent the rampant commercialism from continuing to dehumanize our profession. So, if you're successful, one of you one day can stand up here and address a graduating class from this medical school. And you can say, without question, we've given you a perfect world. Don't screw it up. <laughs> Congratulations, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. And now, please join me in welcoming our student-nominated speaker, Devorah Lichtman. As a representative of the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, class of 2019, I would like to express my appreciation to my class and to the Zucker School of Medicine for the opportunity to address you all today. When I think back four short years ago to the beginning of it all, I remember nervously walking through the doors at Hofstra University on our very first day with 99 other anxious strangers. We had little in common other than the desire to become physicians. Within a few weeks, that group of complete strangers evolved into a loving and caring family who banded together to climb the daunting mountain of medical school. A family that is driven, hardworking, and dedicated, but at the same time there to lift a friend up when they are down and present to share in another's triumphs. A family comprised of men and women, teachers, engineers, scientists, performing artists, mothers, fathers, traditional and non-traditional students, multicultural, multilingual, and multiracial medical students, an eclectic group that has woven a tight web of friendship and camaraderie. We did more than tolerate our differences. We celebrated them. We used the diversity as an opportunity to learn from each other and to expand our knowledge base about cultures and beliefs other than our own. We are the class that piloted Diversity Night which is now an annual event here at Zucker. And our family lovingly created a home here at the Zucker School of Medicine. The school is hard pressed to find a class that will measure up to our inclusive family. But that's not all that makes the class most exceptional. There's more. In Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, he describes leadership qualities that inspire loyalty and motivate people to take action. In his opinion, an effective leader is able to portray the reason behind why they do what they do, 
and that message leaves a lasting impression on others. To quote his words, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. He describes his approach to leadership as a golden circle, which is comprised of three concentric circles. At the center of the golden circle is why, immediately surrounded by an outer circle of how, and then in the outermost circle, what. What do we do? We are doctors. We help people stay healthy and heal the sick. Everyone knows that. How we know what to do? Well, that, be that training began four or more years ago and will continue for the foreseeable future. Why we do what we do? This is where the Zucker School of Medicine, class of 2019, truly stands apart. Why did we all choose the noble profession of medicine? Take a moment and think about it. It's the question most commonly asked on medical school and residency interviews. Why do you want to be a doctor? In regard to our class, the, the answer to this question began long before enrollment into medical school. The answer to the question why, in this case, is passion. Ask any individual in our class why they chose to become a physician, or rather, why they chose a certain field in medicine, and the answer at its core is because I am passionate about caring for a certain patient population or I am passionate about treating a specific disease state. The root of the answer is filled with passion. Passion is something that is infectious and palpable and is not easily feigned. We are a class of doctors, well, almost doctors, that started our profession with why and then worked on the what and then the how. It's no surprise that every residency in this country wants a piece of our special family. It's full of natural leaders. As we continue on our journey in medical training, everyone can agree that healthcare is changing. It's changing in more ways than the new scientific breakthroughs, new medications, and new diagnostic tests. The structure of the healthcare system is completely different than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Medical teams that were once physician only are now dis multidisciplinary. The authoritative culture of medicine has melted away into shared decision making. The momentum of change is ongoing and will continue to transform how healthcare is delivered. As we become interns in the next month and a half, who better to be on the front lines of this evolution than a diverse class of doctors who are passionate about what they do and why they do it? We are in a unique position to be the, the face of that change and steer it in the direction that we feel will benefit society. As one of my favorite authors, Theodore Geisel, also known as Dr. Seuss, once wrote, <laughs> Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Ladies and gentlemen, that is who you have before you, a class of young doctors who care an awful lot, people who will accomplish astronomical achievements with their careers because their hearts and their souls are in the right place. It is my hope and blessing to this class that everyone will take their talents, respect for humanity, and their passion to work every day, and that we will all share in the outstanding successes that our class will achieve. I am incredibly proud to say that I am a graduate of the Zucker School of Medicine, class of 2019, and I believe that the best is yet to come. Thank you. present oh, my God. award. <laughs> Could we reverse the roles? Be my guest. <laughs> Will the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy please rise? President Rabinowitz, I have the honor now to present to you the students who have satisfied all the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell and I am pleased to join with the faculty in recommending that you confer the degree of Doctor of Philosophy upon these candidates. By ver no, 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 I have to confer the degree. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Graduates, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the trustees of Hofstra University, the regents of the state of New York, and upon the recommendation of Dean Smith and the faculty of the School of Medicine, I am delighted to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Philosophy. Congratulations.
We ask that each of the graduates come to the stage to be introduced by Dr. Betty Diamond, Program Director of the PhD and MD-PhD programs, hooded by their primary investigators, be recognized by President Stuart Rabinowitz and Michael Dowling, and receive their diplomas. Patricia, Patricia Marie Avancena, who will be hooded by her mentor, Dr. Yang Rizu. Jacqueline Marie Nestor, who will be hooded by her mentors, Bruce Folpe and myself. Yolanta Barbara Norelli, who will be hooded by her mentor, Dan Grandy. So now we will recite together the Oath of the Scientist, and I invite all PhDs, all MDs graduating with distinction in research, and all researchers to rise and join with us uh, in reciting this oath. You can find the oath on the last page of the program. So please stand, and let's recite together. By accepting my doctor, please join. By accepting my doctor of philosophy degree, I earnestly assert that I will apply my scientific skills and principles to benefit society. I will continue to practice and support a scientific process that is based on logic, intellectual rigor, personal integrity, and an uncompromising respect for truth. I will treat my colleagues' work with respect and objectivity and be a collaborator within the scientific community, sharing knowledge and resources resulting from my research. I will teach these scientific principles to my students. I will seek to increase public understanding of the principles of science and its humanitarian goals. These things I do promise. Will the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Medicine please rise? It's getting close. President Rabinowitz, I have the honor now to present to you those students who have satisfied all the requirements for the Doctor of Medicine in the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, and I am pleased to join with the faculty in recommending that you confer the degree Doctor of Medicine upon these candidates. Graduates, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the trustees of Hofstra University, by the Regents of the State of New York, and upon the recommendation of Dean Smith, the fabulous faculty of the medical school, I am delighted to confer upon you your degree, Doctor of Medicine. Congratulations.
We ask that each of the graduates come to the stage to be introduced by Dr. Ellen Perlman, Associate Dean for the Advanced Clinical Experience, hooded by Dr. David Battinelli, Vice Dean, be recognized by Stuart Rabinowitz, President of Hofstra University, and Michael Dowling, President and CEO of Northwell Health, and receive their diplomas. Before the procession of our Doctor of Medicine candidates, please join us as we proudly welcome 2018 alumnus, Dr. Tyler Lopachin. Tyler will lead Jessica Arat in her military oath of office, signifying her promotion in the U.S. Navy Medical Corps. After recitation of her oath, which you can find printed in the back of the program, Jessica's parents will uncover the new stripe on Jessica's sleeve showing her new rank of lieutenant, and she will receive her hood signifying her graduation and MD degree. Jessica, Tyler. Thank you, sir. Attention to the oath. I state your name. I, Jessica Aris. Do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So it's my pleasure to present to you Dr. Dina Abiri, being hooded by her father, Dr. David Abiri. Dr. Camillo Acosta, being hooded by his father, Dr. Pedro Acosta. Dr. Daniel Alanco. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Brandon E. Alba. Degree conferred with distinction in research. Dr. Asad Ashraf, being hooded by his father, Dr. Mohammed Ashraf. Also a degree conferred with distinction in research. Dr. Tanner A. Aiden. Dr. Yonatan Bardash. Also, a degree conferred with distinction in research. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Bonnie Hope Benson. My apologies. <laughs> um, Dr. Patricia Avancena. Dr. Kara Bloomgarden, being hooded by her father, Dr. Gary Bloomgarden. <laughs> Dr. Levi S. Brown. Dr. Kevin Cabrera. <laughs> Dr. Nicholas Chan. Dr. Bradley Chi. Dr. Josephine Corey. Degree conferred with distinction in research. <laughs> Dr. Madison Daly. Dr. Katrina Lingat Dima Anu. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Kevin K. Dew, being hooded, being hooded by his sister, Carol Dew Leung. Dr. Russell Elms. <laughs> Dr. Brian Emmert. Dr. Stephanie Angel Eng. <clears throat> Dr. Jennifer Drummond. Dr. Evan Feldman. <laughs> Dr. Dennis Powers Fitzgerald. Dr. Vladislav Foman. <laughs> Dr. Victoria Catherine Fort being hooded by her father, Dr. Dudley Clark Fort, Jr. Dr. Michael G. Fanaro. Dr. Stephanie L. Gambino. <laughs> Dr. Rachel Paula Gerber. Dr. Robert Grad. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Rachel Lee Gray. Dr. Brittany C. Gudadoria. <laughs> Dr. Daniel H. Hart. Dr. Chelsea E. Hartman. Dr. Sarah A. Hartman. Dr. Patrick S. Hartnett, being hooded by his brother, Dr. Joseph Hartnett. Dr. Michael Shinhai Jin. Dr. Dennis J. Kesselman. <laughs> Dr. Christophoros Kumas. Dr. Nia Lalkia. Congratulations. Dr. Brittany Catherine Latanza. Dr. Eva Levy. <laughs> Dr. Devorah Lichtman. <laughs> being hooded by her father, Dr. Murray Wurzberger. Dr. Dishan Lin. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Lena Liu. Dr. Chris Zilu. Being hooded by his mother, Dr. Jenny Liu. Dr. Michael Luke. Being hooded by his sister, Dr. Manju Luke. <laughs> Dr. Kelsey Naomi McLeod. Dr. Franklin McNeil IV. <laughs> Dr. Margareta Massey. Dr. Catherine Loriana Manaya. <laughs> Dr. Shaniza A. Moore. Dr. Frank Moda. <laughs> Dr. Sarah Mosayan, being hooded by former alumnus, uh, her brother, Dr. Cameron, and her other brother, Dr. Ali. Mosaic. <laughs> Dr. Peter Nalka. Degree conferred with distinction in research. <laughs> Dr. Eric Matthew Nacy. Dr. Jacqueline Marie Nestor.
Dr. Jolanta Barbara Norelli. Dr. Anita H. Wynn. Dr. Desiree A. Oyola. Dr. Vasiliki Papa Germanos. Dr. Ellen Picar. Dr. David W. Flom. Dr. Danielle Y. Ching. Dr. Kristen Reese. <laughs> Dr. Judith Rivas. Dr. Aubrey Christine Rogers. You go, girl. Dr. Roberto Rosario. Dr. Narayan Sadagopan, uh, being hooded by his parent, Andal Sadagopan. Dr. Jessica Lauren Schwartz. Being hooded by her mother, Dr. Susan Cohen. Oh. 
Dr. Adam Siyum. Dr. Michelle Y. Shi. Dr. Adam Blinn Siegel. Dr. April R. Slamowitz. Degree conferred with distinction in research. <laughs> Dr. Elise Stave, <laughs> being hooded by her parents, Drs. Greg Stave and Christine Hunt. Also, distinction in research. Dr. Daniel Steiner. Dr. Josiah D. Strasser. Dr. U.G. Sun. <laughs> Dr. Jonathan W. Tam. Dr. Alexis Chaconis. Also degree conferred with distinction in research. Dr. Elena R. Thompson. Dr. Ana Lucia Valle Paz. Being hooded by her aunt, Dr. Sylvia Paz, in honor of her grandfather, Dr. Francisco Paz. Dr. Benjamin Viacres Mori. Dr. Chris Wang, 
being hooded by his parents, Dr. Shin Wen Wang and Yu Yang. Dr. Kelly Christine Watson. Being hooded by her cousin, Dr. Eric Interval, in honor of her grandfather, Dr. Carl Blake. Dr. Nicole M. Way. Being hooded by her father, Dr. Lawrence Way. Dr. Caitlin Whalen. Dr. Elaine Catherine Williams. Being hooded by her parents, Drs. Ann and Douglas Williams. Dr. Benny Yu Wong. Degree conferred with distinction in research. Dr. Michael T. Watman. Dr. Pratiksha R. Yalaki Shetter. Being hooded by her mother, Lakshmi Ramesh. Dr. Ariel Shana Sarah Yeshua. <laughs> and last but not least, Dr. Edward Zhao. Well, congratulations, everyone. Doctors all.
So I'd like all the now MDs in the room to please stand and go to the oath of the physician and let's try to say it together. We'll wait till you get ready. Okay. I swear to fulfill to the best of my ability and judgment this covenant. I will respect the hard-won scientific gains of all those physicians whose steps I walk and gladly share such knowledge as is mine with those who are to follow. I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science, and that warmth, sympathy, and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. I will not be ashamed to say I know not, nor will I fail to call on my colleagues when the skills of another are needed for patients' recovery. I will respect the privacy of my patients, for their problems are not disclosed to me that the world may know. Most especially, I must tread with care in matters of life and death, and never abuse the power that has been bestowed upon me. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect not only the person, but a family and community. I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. I will remember that I remain a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings, those sound of mind and body, as well as the infirm. I will maintain the health of my own body and spirit. Yeah. appropriately. If I do not violate this oath, may I enjoy life and art, respected while I live, and remembered with affection thereafter. May I always act so as to preserve the finest traditions of my calling. And may I long experience the joy of healing those who seek my help. And now why doesn't every, everyone take their seats and congratulations again to the graduates. Now, Dr. Cohn mentioned that I was his primary care physician when we were together at Stony Brook. Uh, that was probably the peak of my, my, my power as a physician because you'll notice that I made Dr. Perlman swear that she would not hung, hug the students today. <laughs> and you see how well that worked. So I'm supposed to give you closing remarks, concluding thoughts, or whatever that means, and I never pass that up. But before I do that, I want to introduce the, the one person who's sitting here that's important, my son, Chris. Chris. And the person who's missing is the story I want to tell. So most of you know that this year, my wife of 47 years passed away. And she was a very special person for me as a physician. She taught me every day what a good doctor did and what a good doctor didn't do. 42 years ago, I was a second year resident. I had a son named Chris, who was a real difficult baby. <laughs> and a pregnant, four month pregnant wife who was not doing well. The diagnosis was made of stage 2B Hodgkin's disease, and she was sent immediately to a radiation oncologist at the medical center that I was a resident. And I remember me that meeting. They had examined her, and we sat in the room, and this physician came in and said, Mrs. Smith, you have Hodgkin's. It's involving your airway. We need to abort this child immediately and start you on radiation treatment followed by chemotherapy. So there were two things odd about this conversation. One was the complete lack of empathy. And the other was not a single question about what my wife might prefer to do. But being a person who never was too passive, 
She looked at this doctor, and I can remember, and said, okay, you better have plan B, because we're not doing plan A. And this physician said, well, you don't understand. I'm an expert in this. I've treated lots of people, and there is no other choice. If you don't abort that child and then have significant radiation, you won't live to the end of the pregnancy. And she just looked at her, and she looked at me and said, let's go. And we stood up and we left, and in the car she cried, and then she said, well, we're not doing that, so we better find somebody else. And I was lucky enough to know maybe the best doctor I ever met, who was a medical oncologist, and he met with her, and he took the time to research every conceivable treatment in pregnancy that was safe, and determined that she was a candidate for localized radiation with a shielding of the baby that would relieve the pressure on her trachea, and then full treatment following pregnancy, because that's what she wanted, not what the doctor wanted. And in fact, my son Kevin, who's not sitting here, would greatly appreciate what was done, uh, since he's doing quite well at the moment. Uh, but of course, she did have a cancer, and she did have massive amounts of radiation treatment. And we embarked on a life together, always knowing that there was the potential for problems. And she became a really professional patient. And when she went to doctors, she was a little bit demanding that they actually listen to her, uh, a radical thought. And so, lo and behold, the electronic medical record comes, and none of us are big fans of it. And she come home one, comes home one day, you know, I came home, and there she is, seething. And I said to her, what is the matter? She said, that damn specialist, the doctor, I won't tell you who, sent me to, you're never going to believe what happened. I said, so tell me what happened. She says, so I'm sitting there, and he's asking question after question, and typing the answers onto the computer. When I just get a sense that the questions don't make sense, with the answer I just gave. I said, she said, I just knew. He, nobody would not have followed up what I just said with another question. Instead, he was just going down a list. So I stopped when he stopped typing, and I said, look at me. What did I just say to you? And he couldn't tell her. And she stood up and said, someday maybe you'll grow up to be a real doctor, and walked out of his office and never came back. But her experience with doctors she wasn't fond of continued. So lo and behold, right when we started this medical school, first class, first party, my wife had a, a number of really terrifying, life-threatening episodes of no blood pressure, profound bradycardia, pacemakers put in, CPR done twice, and Lo and behold, it was discovered that she had a syndrome called baroreflex failure, which is from radiating your carotid sinus, and you lose all your sense of whatever your blood pressure is. Well, it did take her 35 years to get that, but, uh, but that's what it was. And there's literally one medical center in the United States that's actually expert on it. That and my wife, who quickly read the world's literature 10 times over, understood the treatments, talked to the people at that medical center, and had a wonderful wonderful, wonderful cardio-oncologist at Memorial Hospital. So she's seeing multiple physicians, and she has all her medical history typed out and her 22 medicines and how she takes them. And uh, so this day, I forget what the consultant was. But anyway, she says to him, listen, if you're going to take, take care of me, you have to understand I have this thing, baroreflex failure, and it's really, really scary. When it happens, you can't believe what happens to me. I, like, fall on the floor, the ambulance gets called, and all kinds of bad things happen. She said, you probably have never heard of baroreflex failure. And he says, oh, I know everything about it. She said, oh, well, tell me. And he looked at her, and she said, tell me about it. Since I was going to tell you about it, why don't you tell me about it? And he just looked at her and says, well, I actually don't know anything. Once again. 
She got up and left. <laughs> Those were the stories that all my life I heard, the good and the bad. Believe me, she also told me about the wonderful people. But she always ended each one of those sad stories saying, how did they forget why they ever started all this? What is this about? One person who doesn't respect any of my decision making and is willing to tell me I have to kill my own child. Another who doesn't bother listening to me because they're obsessed with filling out this ridiculous electronic medical record. And then someone who has zero humility, who can't even tell me that I have an illness that I know everything about that almost no doctor knows about, and they have to pretend that they're an expert. So I want to leave you with those thoughts, because those were three of the hundreds that she taught me every day that made me every day a better doctor than I ever was before. And so I leave you with the thoughts that she left me all the time. Listen to your patients. Don't be arrogant. And always remember to ask the patient what they want to do. Because in the end, it is their body and it is their illness. And so let me. <laughs> let me share with you one of my favorite poems. It was written by William Stafford, 26 days before he died. William Stafford was a poet who wrote every day of his life. And I think he was talking about what my wife asked when she said, how could they have forgotten why they started all of this? There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are per pursuing. You have to explain about the thread but it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you, can, nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. I wish you well that you never let go of the thread that you understand is the privilege of being a doctor and a healer. And you always remember that the only payment that will ever matter in the end is your patient's love. And so with that, we're ending our, our session today, your graduation. There is a tent outside of it still raining. You can take pictures with everybody and anybody. And please make sure all of you cross back over to the medical school to join us for our celebration. Thank you.